working? Yes? No? Yes. Hi. Good morning. All right. So I'm afraid we have to put the newspapers down. <laughs> Why? Uh, well, I'm hoping you might listen to me, but, you know, if you want to read the newspaper instead, it's, it's okay. All right. So good morning, everyone. I say I didn't lose everybody, so, so that's a good sign. Um, however... You guys asked lots of questions yesterday, which is excellent. So as you noticed, we didn't actually talk anything about the Higgs boson yesterday. So I've had to re-change the, the, the lecture schedule a bit. Um, so you'll see. We'll still cover everything, but I've rearranged things um, a little bit. So just getting started, um, first of all, the aircon is working again, in case you hadn't noticed. Um, and just a reminder about cell phones. Um, we're hoping, we're not ex we would like them to be on silent. And of course, we don't want anyone to take calls or make calls. Apparently, someone made a call in a lecture yesterday. Um, so so just, to, just to say that. OK, so here's the revised um, schedule. So yesterday, what we actually did, of course, is we talked all about the standard model. We talked about everything in the standard model except the Higgs boson. So that's what we're going to talk about first today. And then we're going to talk a bit about accelerators which is actually how we go about making all these different particles. Now, I promised to put the lectures online. So if you want to write one thing down, it's this, OK? This is the link to yesterday's lecture, that if you click on that link, you can download it. I will put, as we go through the week, I will add them for each of the different lectures. Um, and then I can, so you can also write them all down at the end of the week if you prefer. Yes. So, so the question was, is there a thing called a boson? And the answer is yes. There are actually two types of particles, and they are called fermions and bosons. Okay? And what this is about is something that I only mentioned briefly, which is about the spin of particles. So bosons have spin one integer spin, and fermions have half integer spin. And so there are a number of different bosons. In fact, remember all the force particles we talked about? Those are all the bosons. All the matter particles we talked about, those are all the fermions. And so the Higgs boson is a boson, but it's one of them. There are others as well. OK, is that enough time? Anyone need more time to write down the link or take a picture? Yes, take your time. I don't want to rush anybody. <coughs> All right, okay. So then, one more second, one last photo. All right, then let's get started. So just a couple of slides to remind you about all the things we talked about last time. So we, I introduced the Stanner model and talked about how it's our current fundamental theory. But of course, um, fundamental theories are things that can change. And I hope that if I came back 10 years from now, maybe I'd be telling you something different as our fundamental theory. And we talked about the two types of particles. So actually, this is what I was just mentioning now. We talked about all the different matter particles. These are the fermions. And we talked about all the force, forces. We also talked a bit about how forces can be both fields and particles at the same time. Um, but mostly in this context, we'll think about this, them as um, particles. So here are the little sketches that I showed you, right? which are showing you all the different types of quarks and all the different types of leptons about the fact that we have all these copies in terms of the families, which we just sort of repeat, and we kind of don't know why. And we also talked about the four different forces. We talked about gravitation, electromagnetism, the weak, and the strong force. And remember, we're not going to say much about gravity, and that's just because we actually don't know what to say um, in terms of quantum theory um, of gravity. A photon is a boson. No, the graviton exists. Actually, in fact, now we really know that they exist because from this experiment, which maybe you've heard of, called LIGO, right? Which there was some there was some news last year about LIGO seeing gravitational waves. What that, of course, actually means is that they've been gravitons that came from these black holes all the way to the LIGO detector, and they've actually detected them. So there has to be a particle, and actually there. I said bosons have spin one. The truth is bosons have integer spin. Actually, the graviton has spin two um, of the particles. Um, so so this needs, there needs to be a graviton. The problem is we don't know how to do the mathematics of the graviton. That's, that's the issue. 
Um, that's the part that's missing. Um, so, but hopefully someone's going to figure it out. Yeah. We just don't know how to. So everything I'm telling you about here is, is backed up by mathematics, right? So there are actually pages of mathematics which we can write down, for example, you know, the interactions between different particles. With the graviton, that's the part we can't do. And so we can talk about it, but the problem is it's not backed up by a rigorous theory that actually tells us about it. And so that's, it's also not really related to, to what we're talking about. So if we put it all together, this is kind of one of my favorite sketches. This actually puts together all the different particles that we've talked about. And so you have the quarks sitting there, you have the leptons sitting at the bottom, and you have the forces sitting in the middle. And this actually puts all the particles um, together into one single picture. What's kind of funny is actually where this picture comes from. And it's not actually from a particle physicist. Actually, it comes from a movie. I don't know if anyone's seen the movie which is called Particle Fever. So if you look, there's a link at the bottom. Um, it's just particlefever.com. It, you can actually, if you click on the link, you can actually watch it for free um, online. And actually, it's a, I, I like the movie. It's actually a movie that was originally meant to be about CERN. And so they actually came to CERN and they have a few physicists that they chose to sort of follow for a few years. But what was interesting is that they realized during the process of making the movie that there was something interesting going on in terms of the Higgs. And so the movie actually changed while it was being made into being a movie about the discovery of the Higgs boson. So that's kind of cool. Um, and, I, and we actually enjoy it. I'm in it, but for about 10 seconds. So I doubt you'll actually spot me. Um, I was working in the control room when they were filming. Yes. Oh, yes. Most definitely, it's more about the human side of things, um, about all the people, you know, about the psychology, about how things work. No, most definitely, um, it's, a, it's a fun movie. Um, I recommend it. <coughs> and another way you can look at things is you can take the standard model, and here, by the way, this is actually all the mathematics I'm talking about. This is actually the mathematical description of the standard model, by which I mean, you know, all these different particles and their interactions. And this is something you can buy at CERN. They actually have a mug where they put the equations on. Amusing story, it actually has a typo on it. Um, this thing here, which says plus HC, I won't explain the details of it, but actually technically it shouldn't be there. And so nowadays there are actually two versions of this mug, one with the bug and one without the bug. So yes, even CERN can produce mugs with equations, fairly basic equations, which maybe aren't necessarily perfectly correct. Um, yeah. Okay. So now we're going to move on and talk about the topic of the course, which is the Higgs um, boson. So I've been telling you how perfect the standard model is and how everything looks good, right? Actually, that's not true at all. Um, if you look at these equations very carefully, what you actually find is that everything would be fine and we'd be done if all the particles had no mass at all, okay? Um, that's, that's how it works and that's kind of a bit of a problem because actually, all the particles, many of the particles have mass. And here I'm showing you a real plot, okay? So this is like one of the physics results that came out of the Atlas experiment quite recently. And all it is, the way you want to read this is it's actually measuring the mass of the W boson, okay? So that's what's on the x-axis. On the y-axis are various different measurements that you can have, okay? And all you need to pay attention to is this one over here, um, which is actually showing you the values that you get from it. So this is the combined one. This is the recent Atlas measurement. And what you, you want to see is that is most definitely not zero, right? It's actually 80,370 with an uncertainty of 20. So this is very far from zero. And this is just an example. Um, the reason I'm showing you, it's actually a very impressively precise measurement, this one, how well it's been done. But the point is, is that we know experimentally and we've known for very many years that the particles most definitely have mass. There's no doubt about this. And so this is a problem. So you have a theory which says the particles have no mass. You have the experiment which tells you that they most definitely do. And you really need to find a way to resolve this. Of course, yeah. How do you measure mass? So <coughs> I wish I had a plot. Okay, so the question here is how do we define mass? So, I um, mean, particle physics is a little bit different, okay? So the way that we actually define mass is, again, it's a property of a particle. 
And actually what happens is when you actually make a plot, I don't have an example to show you now, but there will be some later when we talk about the Higgs, you can basically, when you actually get two particles which have the mass of it, you end up getting a peak. So you basically make a plot that looks like this, and the mean of the peak, that actually is the measurement of the mass of the particles. So it's just using four vectors where you basically take the, you take whatever this particle decays to, you measure its energy and its momentum, and you sum this up using E equals mc squared, and this way you can actually get the m from the energy on the other side. So that's how we're actually measuring mass when we talk about it in particle physics. No. In fact, in particle physics, and you can see it here, we actually use a really wacko unit which is called an electron volt. Okay? It doesn't really matter. We could convert it to grams. The reason we do it is that it's convenient in terms of the units that we have, right? Because it actually gives us not very large numbers. If we measured, or very small numbers, if we measured things in grams, we'd again have these lots and lots of zeros, which we would actually need to, need to talk about. And it's not just the bosons, the force-carrying particles that have mass. Actually, the quarks have mass. And so what this picture is showing you is you can see all these different circles, right? And you remember from last time, we talked about like the up quark and the down quark, the strange and the charm. The size of the circle is actually showing you what the mass is of the different particles. And so what you can see here is that, for example, the top quark, which is this enormous circle here, is way, way heavier than the, the up quarks and the down quarks. And so what it's showing us, again, is the same message, that they have masses, and they even have different masses, depending on the particles, which makes things even more um, complicated. So this is a bit, of a, a bit of a problem. Now, I'm sure you remember from physics about potential energy, right? Everyone remember potential energy? So this is a simple, simple example, because we're going to talk about a complicated one, is you have a car, right? It goes up the mountain, and then it can basically come straight down the mountain without actually needing any acceleration, because it can use the potential energy that it got. In this case, we're talking about gravity, of course, right? But it's the same idea for all these different forces that I talked about, is you can actually get potential energy, and then you can use up that energy. Now, the reason I showed you this is I need to show you this plot, which is actually showing you the potential for the Higgs boson, okay? And so it's in a weird space, which we don't need to worry about too much, but it's the same concept is potential is a way that you can see how the force works because you can actually get how the force comes from by it's actually technically taking the derivative um, to get from one to the other. So here it is. So first of all, let's imagine we're sitting in the early universe, okay? So this is way long ago. This is when everything is really hot um, at the beginning. And here what we have is we have a sort of um, parab parabolic shape potential and the interesting thing about these potentials is you want to actually look for really the minimum of it because this is actually the point where it will be. And so here's a particle, here's the minimum, and it's sitting right at the center here <coughs> um, at zero. Now, the important thing that happens is when you move from the early universe into today, what we say is imagine, okay, and this is just a hypothesis, we say imagine that instead of having a potential like this, we have a potential which has this thing in the middle, right? This sort of, I don't know how we describe it, a piece that comes up in the middle, okay? Now again, we look at our little particle sitting in the potential, and we think about trying to find the minimum of the potential. If you think about it, it's actually this green circle that you can see around here. And by minimum, I mean just the lowest value. And it's along the circle, but the difference to here is that there are actually many different spots you could be along the circle, right? So it could be that the ball falls down here, it could be that the ball falls down here, it could be that the ball falls down there. And it looks, you're wondering why I'm telling you about this, right? It feels kind of artificial. But what this actually gives us is something which is called spontaneous symmetry breaking. And what we mean by that is the fact that once you choose a spot here, your picture is no longer symmetric. So the point is, is that being over there is not the same as being over there, whereas if you look at this potential on the other hand, you can imagine flipping it in a mirror, you can imagine rotating it, 
and it will stay the same. And so that's the idea of the symmetry, is you imagine you take your picture, you change it in some way, and you ask the question, does it look the same? Okay? Now that sounds completely weird um, to do it, but what it actually turns out is if you imagine a potential like this, and you say, imagine there's a particle that behaves this way, this trick of being able to choose a preferred direction actually allows one to have particles which are both massless and massive. Sounds weird. The idea is, is that in the original equations, they're all massless, right? Which they need to be. We talked about the standard model needs them to be massless. But once you actually go into this picture where you actually do this breaking of the symmetry, that adds an extra little piece in the equation which actually gives the particles um, a mass. And so this is the idea of it. It's a mathematical trick, okay? To see this properly, this is whoever was asking me about reading the mathematics, you want to actually see how this works. But that is actually the mechanism by how you actually end up being able to be both massless and be um, massive. Any questions on this? I know this was fairly complicated. <laughs> Lots, no questions, because it made no sense at all. Yes. So it's not about time, it's about temperature, okay? So what it is, is when the universe is very hot, then things are symmetric. But as it cools down, it becomes lower and lower, and at some point you fall below a threshold at which this is able to, is able to happen. So it is time dependent in that sense, but it's simply because of the temperature of the universe actually um, changing. maximum temperature. So this is, sorry, this axis is the potential itself, right? Okay, so this is just about, you know, the amount of energy that's kind of available in the Higgs field. Because there is a Higgs field, and you can think about potential as being a sort of measure of how much energy is in the field. <coughs> but this picture is only true in the early universe, and this picture is what is true now. And of course, with these particle accelerators, in some way, we're going back in time because we're going up to these very high energies. We can actually probe what things were like in the early um, universe. Of course. That's a very good question. Actually, the Higgs, um, it applies to the Higgs, but it applies to other particles. And actually, the ones that are the most problematic um, are the W and the Z bosons, okay? So these are the particles where we have, they have to have mass, and we know this from the measurement of the mass, from how the force works, and we have no way to do it. And so the Higgs was actually initially introduced to fix the problem with the masses of the W and the Z bosons. The Higgs has a mass itself, um, but um, it wasn't added to, to achieve that. You actually get the Higgs because you're trying to fix the mass. Um, that it's, it's that way around. So maybe just to help a little bit with this, is here's a picture showing you that maybe you've seen before, showing the different phases of water, right? So we all know very well you can have ice, you can have water, and you can have steam, right? But at all times, it's still water, right? It's the same thing. And what it actually depends on, so I'm showing you again another plot, depends on what temperature you have, it also depends on the pressure, right? And so if you know the pressure and the temperature, then you'll end up being in these different phases. Of course, what it means, right, is if the pressure is super low, you can actually have steam at pretty low temperatures. On the other hand, so you can really move around here and this tells you the difference. And so it's a, this is just, of course, a sketch showing that. You can kind of do the same thing for the Higgs, right? thinking about the temperature of the early universe and kind of where we are in the Higgs potential. And so it's sort of like a phase diagram, but the phase here, we're talking about the universe, right, to be able to get there, is you can actually move from these different behaviors um, between um, the two of them. So I'm not talking about pressure here. That was just an analogy. So, so I mean, the point of showing this 
was showing phase diagrams, and this was how the one of water works. The one for the Higgs is using different ones, but it's the same kind of idea, is that you can, depending on the temperature, you can have a field which has different um, properties. idea basically is that you have one Higgs field, right? There's one idea. But the way that it actually works in the universe depends on the temperature of the universe. I think that's maybe a way to, to think about it, is that it's the field that's changing, not the water that's changing. I think that's the difference in the analogy. The water one is of course simple because you just have water and you look at it in different ways. But here what we're saying is switch out the water put in this potential which tells us how this Higgs is working, and this again works in um, different ways, depending. This is also true, but actually the phase diagram, the reason I showed you that, it has a deeper connection, in fact, because um, there are other features in it that actually get reproduced in terms of the Higgs, which is actually something we're trying to figure out right now is actually how similar it is to different features in the phase diagram. So it's actually the correct analogy, just maybe maybe not so easy to, to explain um, how it works. There's things like triple points and first and second order transitions, which is actually really an active field of research um, right now. We don't know the, the answers. OK. <coughs> so that was all about potentials. And if you didn't follow every detail of that, that's OK. Now you can listen again, and we can talk about it afterwards. No, it's, it's very hard to explain this without doing the full mathematics. So um, now we're going back to thinking about the particles. So I mentioned that this Higgs has this trick, right, which allows particles to get masses. And actually, once you've accepted that there is a trick that can do this, the way you can figure out different particles' masses is basically by how strongly they interact with the Higgs field. So what this means is that the heavier particles, they have more interactions with the Higgs. They like the Higgs more. Or you can say it's the other way around. You can say the particles that interact strongly with the Higgs become heavier. So you can think about it either way around. You can say they are heavy because they interact with the Higgs, or they interact with the Higgs because they are heavy. doesn't matter. It doesn't really make a, make a big um, difference between the two. Now, who's heard of the ether? Everybody. Maybe even it was actually, I'm not sure when they last taught the ether during physics. Maybe it was still, no? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> All right. So actually, here's a fun fact. It turns out there is an ether. OK? Yep. But it's not the ether that people used to talk about. Because the point is, this Higgs field, right, is actually a field that, that is throughout the universe, everywhere there. And the way that the particles get mass is by interacting with that field. This is precisely an ether, where you have this field all the way through space. And so that's kind of weird and kind of interesting um, that we have. And here's a sort of an, an analogy that I like um, about it, because you might be asking, you know, how come we don't feel this ether? Why can't we tell about it? <coughs> and the analogy is a fish tank, OK? So imagine for a second that you're a fish and you live in your fish tank, right? Maybe it's simpler, let's get rid of all the plants, let's have just a pure fish tank and um, some fish in it. Now, you will actually not necessarily know that you're in water, right? Because that will just be the world around you. You'll be swimming around and you'll just assume that the whole, that everything, that water is normal. This is how everything is. But actually, if we're sitting outside here, looking at the fish tank, we know that the fish are in the water. And so this is the same analogy with the ether. If there's something there that's really all the way through space, it may not be possible to detect it because you can't actually be outside it. And so it can be like that, that there is a Higgs field that's there. Now, it's not going to do anything to you, by the way, um, having a Higgs field here. It's not going to do anything bad. It's not going to cause any diseases or anything like that. And it's always been that way. We just actually just don't know um, about it. Kind of another fun fact is you might ask, OK, fine, the Higgs makes mass. So can I blame the Higgs field for being fat? Unfortunately, bad news, the answer is no. Um, <laughs> that's not true for a few reasons. But actually, 
What's kind of interesting, and this is something I think I mentioned yesterday, is the fact that if you look at ordinary matter, like, you know, sort of day-to-day -day scales, when we're talking about protons, etc., it's not the Higgs that makes all the mass. Actually, it turns out that if you look at the mass of the three quarks, which sit inside the proton, which we talked about yesterday, this is actually only 0.2% of the total proton mass, okay? And the reason is, is that I drew some nice pictures, right, telling you that a proton looks like that. Uh, it's true, but it's not the whole story. Actually, a proton looks a bit more like that, okay? And what you're actually seeing in here is you're seeing a whole lot of gluons. So we talked about gluons. We talked about how they carry the strong force and they actually keep things together. What's actually happening is the way they keep together is there are a whole bunch of gluons going in there. And then these guys are actually quark anti-quark pairs, which are kind of popping out of the vacuum and disappearing again. This is something that actually happens in all these different fields, is you can just sort of borrow some energy and give it back after a very, very short amount of time. And so it actually means that inside a proton, it looks a lot more like that. And this is actually the strong force. So the answer is about where the mass of the proton comes from. Just a little bit comes from the Higgs, but actually a whole lot of it comes from the strong force. And this is actually the thing that actually makes most of the mass of everyday objects. So I thought this is something that people like to say the Higgs cause makes mass. It's true, <coughs> but only in the case of elementary particles. When we're looking at things on an everyday scale, actually it's other forces that can make mass. Now, does it sound weird that I said that forces are making mass? Does that sound like a strange thing to say? Yes. Um, and this is because we have these formulas, right, where we're relating energy to mass. And so we have a formula E equals mc squared, right? What it means, of course, and we have the potential, which we were talking about. So forces can have a potential, which gives us energy, and then you can convert it to mass. Now, actually, one and the same thing when you look at things on a very basic level. And so when I talk about it, I'm sort of a little bit sloppy because I know I can convert from one to the other using this equation at any time. And so for us, it's actually not different. Um, when you're looking on a particle level, they're actually really the same thing. And so that's why I might use the different terms interchangeably. Yeah? No? No question? Any questions? Yes? So the point is, is that the original ether, no, you didn't explain it, you, you said it correctly, um, what you were saying, was about um, gra gravitation and about electromagnetism, right? So the point is, is that you could have an ether for any force, right? And the reason that we managed to prove that this wasn't the case is indeed um, because the speed of light, right, was the same in all directions. And so what that told us is there wasn't some preferred direction that we were moving in, right? The difference is the Higgs is a different force. It's absolutely independent, so it has, in some sense, nothing to do with gravitation, nothing to do with electromagnetism. And so we can actually be moving because there isn't, there isn't any way to essentially see a preferred direction. So we have no way of really testing this because at the moment, right, we've just made a few Higgs bosons. That's as far as we've got, right? Well, I'll show you them over the, over the week. We absolutely have no way to do this, but maybe this is something we can figure out how we could actually probe this Higgs field um, in the future. So the reason why it's okay is because it's a different force. Had it been those same forces, then it would have not been possible um, to have had it. So those are still correct. It's just a, a different, um, different force. <coughs> OK. So how do we actually see the Higgs? So unfortunately, um, it's a very unstable particle. It has a lifetime, again, I'm showing you these numbers, of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 22 seconds. So what that means is in sort of, in terms, is it disappears immediately, right? 10 to the minus 22 seconds is extremely short. So it means when we actually make these Higgses, and I'll tell you a bit about how we make them, they're round just for a tiny bit, and then they're gone, okay? So it's absolutely not the case that at CERN, you know, we can make a box of Higgses, and then we can study them, you know, to see their properties. Actually, what happens is we make them, and they disappear immediately, okay? basically um, immediately. And the way we need to see them is because luckily they leave a trace behind. 
what happens is that they decay into other particles. And then those other particles, they are more stable than the Higgs, and we can actually see those particles in our detectors. And so we never actually directly see the Higgs. We actually see the Higgs by the particles that it decays um, to. Remember yesterday we were talking about like concepts of electronness or you know different particles? There are some rules about how particles can decay, and there's some rules about what things need to be conserved. So what that means is if you have a system which has some amount of electronness, you can't get rid of that um, by it. And so this is one way when you look at these decay products, you can kind of figure out what particle they actually came from. Okay? So there are a bunch of rules. We're not going to talk about them all, but just think about the idea is that it's not that the Higgs can decay to anything. There's some strict rules. We even have probabilities, actually, for how often it should decay into certain particles. And so, yeah, so as I was saying, what we're trying to do is to see the Higgs by studying the particles that are produced once it decays. And that's actually mostly what we're going to be talking about, is what it decays to and actually how we can actually see it, um, because this is, the, this is the part that tells us. <coughs> Yes and no. Um, they occurred naturally in the early universe. So the problem is, is the Higgs is really quite heavy. We haven't talked about it yet. So yeah, no. In the in the universe, if I go look with my space, my telescope, I'm not going to find any Higgs bosons because it's just too heavy. If we were able to travel back in time to the early universe, then there were certainly Higgs bosons all around. But the problem is, the universe has got too cold. And so in some sense, what we're trying to do at CERN is to look back in time to see how things were and to actually make particles that were, um, were around. <laughs> in which sense? Very different. So if we did not have a Higgs boson, um, there would be absolutely nothing. Um, all those forces that I was talking about, you know, for example, making the sun shine, all of these actually need these particles, and they need to have mass. So yeah, it matters in the sense of if there wasn't a Higgs, none of this would exist. It has some component. I mean, what you need to make all the elements is you need this full standard model. Okay? So I've given you the last piece. I mean, everything wouldn't work if we left out the weak force as well. This would also be a problem. If we left out the strong force, this would also be a problem. But as far as we understand things, there's no piece in this picture um, maybe except the extra families of the particles that you could leave out and still have the world. You actually need all these pieces because otherwise they're really critical things that would actually mean that the universe would have disappeared almost instantaneously. So you can, yeah, so I mean, yeah, there's no good answer to whether it matters or not. This is a bit of taste, right? Um, for me, I find it interesting. So I try to learn this because I think it's really interesting to understand how things work. Um, but this is a personal question. Um, everybody has their own decisions about what's interesting. I hope you guys think this is interesting since you came to my class. <laughs> yes, that's actually what I'm precisely showing you here. So what I was... Well, it, I mean, there's a probability of it decaying at any certain amount of time. And so this number I'm quoting for you is precisely the half-life of the Higgs. So. This is actually the parameter of the Higgs. And so when I was talking about the Higgs existing in the early universe, actually they were existing and disappearing all the time on the, using the same half-life. Um, but they just came and went um, very quickly. You have to remember, right, when I was talking about this early universe, I'm talking about a tiny fraction of a second, right? And I don't know if you've seen, I'll show it probably on the last day, the picture of sort of the evolution of the universe. That time when you had them around was a very small fraction of a second. So it didn't matter that the Higgs was super unstable, just that time lasted very short. <coughs> yeah, just to say, I'm actually normally talking, whenever I give you numbers, I'm normally talking about averages or half-lives or things. I'm not going to say it every single time, but everything is probabilistic of all the things I'm talking about. So of course, there is some probability that a Higgs would last a little bit longer um, to do it. Oh, that didn't work very well. I want to fix that. Hold on. It will take one second. There we go. Right. 
So that's what I, what I actually wanted to show you. It was actually I cheated when I showed you the picture. I was missing the center. And this is actually why I like this picture, um, is because it actually puts the Higgs boson right in the center of the standard model, because it actually has this critical role um, that um, does it. Now remember I said that all massive particles need to interact with the Higgs. What it actually means is when we want to see the Higgs, is the Higgs can actually decay to all massive particles, okay? Um, so it means you've got lots of choice about how you might actually try and go and find um, the Higgs. And this is the standard model. These are all the different particles that we've talked about. It means there's actually quite a lot of choice of different particles that we could um, go and have a look at. Yes? definitely a transactional particle because it's actually a force particle, right? So the Higgs is a type of force like the photon, like the gluon, and so all of those are indeed transactional particles because they basically, the interaction of the Higgs gives particle mass. And so the way you said it is, is a way to think about it because that other world where the particles are massless would be a very strange world and it's not really the actual world um, that we see um, today. <coughs> it's also though a particle by the way. So it has this role where it can change things, but it's also a real particle that we can measure um, and, and study. So it, it's both. But yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Okay, so actually here is a pie chart which actually shows you all the different particles that the Higgs decays to. And as I said, there's some precise predictions. And so these are actually w the prediction of how often the Higgs would decay to these various different particles. Okay? And this was something we could predict very precisely once you know the mass um, of the Higgs. <coughs> okay. So actually most of the time it turns out the Higgs likes to decay to a pair of B quarks. So remember the quarks? Remember we had the six types and there were the bottom quarks, the quite heavy ones? Actually that's what the Higgs likes to decay to um, the most. It also decays to things like W bosons, to gluons, taus, charm, and all different particles. And actually in here, there are a whole bunch of others. And we need it to decay to all these particles because it has to interact with all particles that um, have mass. Okay? Um, we'll come back to this one a little bit later because if you were paying very close attention yesterday, you might remember that I said that gluons don't have mass. Anyone remember that? So how come the Higgs is decaying to gluons? It's a bit weird. That's something we're going to talk about tomorrow. Um, because there, there is a way that you can do it. Um, but don't worry. What I said is true. It does not directly interact with particles um, without mass. So again, that's the complete standard model. And we talked about the movie um, that we have. So that was it, introducing the Higgs. And now we're actually going to become kind of a bit more practical. Um, I'm going to put my experimentalist hat on and I'm going to tell you a bit about how we actually go about making these particles because we've talked about it, they're not sitting around in the universe so if we actually want to know something about them we really do need to go out and actually make them. <coughs> so the basic idea of it is it's actually a microscope. All right. So microscopes are fairly um, familiar in the sense that what you're trying to do here is you're trying to see these very, very tiny objects by the light that they actually produce. And the microscope is maybe a good analogy, because if you think about it, you put something under a microscope, what you're actually seeing, what you see in your eye, is not exactly the same as that object, right? Because it's actually been magnified, and so you're seeing a picture of that object, which has been magnified by how the microscope works. It's kind of important, because as you're going to see when we talk about it, we can't really see these particles directly that we've been talking about. And again, we're seeing pictures of them and using a much bigger and, in a sense, more complicated microscope. Now, here's a fairly complicated slide, but it's kind of important. What this is, is what it will actually... Oh, the graphic didn't work out very well. That's a pity. So this is imagining. And one other thing, that light that you were using in the microscope to look, this is, of course, a wave, remember? So we have this wave and the particle, and we're actually seeing particles with particles. Right? It's kind of funny to think about it. So here, imagine that we have some wave 
that we're trying to look at something. And here is a slit that we actually have. Okay, so here we have two objects. You're taking this wave and you're making it go through a slit. Okay. Now, what actually happens when you do that is you end up getting an effect on the edge which sort of bends the wave as it passes through the slit. Now, you imagine as you move to the middle here, you've made the slit smaller. And to the right here, you've made the slit really, really small. Okay. What I want you to compare is how the different waves look in each case. And the point of showing this picture is to try and illustrate that the property of the thing you use to look and the size of the thing you're trying to look at determines what you can actually see. And so there's kind of a problem. We can't actually take waves with very, very small, with very small wavelengths to be able to see objects because you'll end up just seeing this diffractive pattern. This is called diffraction, by the way. Um, and you won't actually see the object that you're trying to, to look at. So what it's sort of trying to say is, if you're trying to see very, very small objects, it actually turns out to be energy that you need to have. You need to have very, very high energy to be able to see them. It's kind of like a microscope again, right? I mean, we're thinking about waves here, but it's the same idea. If you don't have enough magnification, you're not actually able to see the smallest objects that you actually want um, to see. So we're going to have some equations. I know some people like equations. Um, maybe some others don't. Um, so here's one, which is that the energy of a particle is proportional inversely. This is what the 1 over means to the wavelength, right? So what basically what that means is as you make the wavelength higher, you make the energy smaller, make the wavelength smaller, you make the energy higher. And what it actually means is when we're trying to see, and remember how small these particles were that we're talking about, we actually need probes with very small wavelengths and very, very high um, energies. Remember all those zeros that we had? Actually, let's go back and look at the slide again. We're talking about trying to see distances of 10 to the minus 16 <coughs> um, centimeters. By the way, the most powerful microscopes that we have they can now see atoms. Okay, This is the scale we can reach, but notice the difference between the two. All right, so you say 8 to 16, it's a factor of 2 between the two. But of course, that's not right. It's 10 to the minus 8 um, that you need to do between the two. And so microscopes are really a long way to be able to do it. So what we actually use is what I've mentioned already, which is an accelerator. And what accelerators do is they basically increase the energy of a particle by increasing its speed. Okay, That's the idea. And actually, we use accelerators all over the place. Maybe you've heard about cancer therapy using accelerators. We also use them in biology, we use them in chemistry, in material science, and in high energy physics. And this, by the way, is kind of one of the useful side effects is these accelerators were developed for high energy physics because we wanted to study particles. And this is basically the best way we know how to do it. Then it turned out actually they were used for a whole bunch of other things. And so nowadays, the accelerators that are used for particle physics are a small fraction of all the accelerators that we actually have um, worldwide. So the way it works is if I have some object and I apply a force to it, then they're going to accelerate. And this is another formula. We're getting a whole bunch of formulas today. Is that the force is equal to the mass of the particle times the acceleration. Or the other way around, if you apply this force, you can divide by the mass. And you can really see how much they accelerate. So one sort of interesting thing, we've talked about all these different forces that we have available. But the way it turns out is that we only know how to use the electromagnetic force in accelerators. This is the only one we knew how to use. And so when we're talking about accelerators, we're always using the electromagnetic force. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Oh, we're going to. We're going to be seeing all sorts of different things. But in terms of acceleration, we actually only know how to use the electromagnetic force at the moment. So here, what we're talking about is the making of the particles. What we're going to talk about tomorrow is how we see them. And the two of them are actually kind of separate. So step one is 
taking particles, making them go really, really fast, so we can see these small distances, then step two is we make a bunch of particles, how do we actually see them? And these two are a little bit separate um, in terms of how you actually go about um, doing it. And remember we talked about charge, right, yesterday? What this means is we can actually only use charged particles in accelerators, because if you have a neutral particle, like say a neutron, it's not going to notice this electric field. So it's always going to be charged particles. In fact, it's going to be 90% of the time it's going to be either electrons or protons. This is what we can actually accelerate um, in accelerators. <coughs> so what happens, right, here's a little bit of a sketch, is here you have some particles, charged particles, which are sitting in an electric field. And what's going to happen is that they end up getting pushed in the direction of the field. And one other thing, if your field is constant, so it has the same value everywhere, and your particles are the same, it means they're actually going to have constant acceleration um, in that field. So here's a little bit of a sketch, um, which is actually showing you how things look. Okay. And here what we're actually seeing is we have an electromagnetic wave where we're looking at it from above. So imagine we're looking at it from above. And we have a positively charged particle. Now they turned into to be blue. And here what we're having is you can really see that as you're actually, so wave what it means, right, is that the field isn't constant anymore. So when you have an electromagnetic field, it's going to have places where it has really high values, where it even has negative values, and where it actually has no value. Um, at all. So this is just looking at the strength of the field, which is having this shape. And this is a very typical shape for fields. So when the particle happens to be here, really near the top, it's going to be feeling a whole big amount of force. As you go down here, where the field has a smaller value, there's going to be less acceleration. As you go down here, actually, there's going to be none at all. It's going to be zero. And then you can actually um, keep going through it. And so what this actually does is it tends to move all the particles together. Because you'll notice that here you're actually going there. These ones are actually feeling a force in the other direction. And so it actually groups together your particles into a nice little clump um, of particles that you actually want to have. So this is, um, the, this is the strength um, of the field. Um, so it's, um, I, I don't want an actual unit here. <coughs> um, it's, it's the force is one way to think about it. Um, I think force is the easiest answer. Wouldn't you get the same effect in an electric motor? In a, sorry? In an electric motor, moving field, moving electric wave, electromagnetic wave, moving the motor. I think it's similar. Um, I'm not sure if the analogy is precise. I'd have to, I'd have to double check uh, for that. Oh, you have to make it. You have to make it um, to be able to do it. Actually, that's that's the complicated part about these accelerators. Exactly. You have to put your particles in very carefully when you fill it. Um, we haven't quite got a real one yet. We're, we're still getting there. Hold on. So the simplest accelerator that you can make is something called a linear accelerator. And guess why it's called linear? It's just a straight line. And the way this works, right, is that you actually have a source. So you have to make all your different particles. And it, you have these little regions where you accelerate it. And so this is answering your question to some extent, is basically you'll have bunches of particles. So it's not really a continuous, it's not like current for electricity. You actually have bunches, and then you have space, and then you have a bunch. What you'd actually do is you time it such that when the pulse comes, the particles are actually there. And if you timed it the wrong way around, then you'd end up getting no acceleration because they'd actually go um, backwards. And the way it works when you have these accelerators is that the energy you get depends on the strength of the electric field and the length of the accelerator. Does this make sense? Higher field, you accelerate the more in each chunk. Longer accelerator, you get to add up more chunks of accelerating them. Problem is, it gets very expensive because you need to make a really long accelerator if you want to get to high energies. By the way, all the stuff we're talking about now is not cheap. Um, in fact, of the experiments, the accelerator is the most expensive part by far. 
Um, so just to know, you really do want to save money here anytime you can. And so a sort of obvious solution you would have is, let's imagine we could make things go in a circle. That way, you can actually reuse the same components because the particles go round and round, and you can actually make, you can get a lot further. People like to say these are how you make compact machines. I'm not sure we should say that when we're talking about, when you'll see how big the LHC is. I, I don't think the word compact is quite right. So we want to make them go round. It's not so simple with particles, right? You can't just put them in a tube. They go through tubes, right? They can go through wherever they want. You actually need to use forces to make particles go where you want. And the way you can actually make particles move in, the, in a circle is using a magnetic field. Now, who remembers how magnetic fields work? Remember they were right-hand rules? Yeah, there we go. I see some right-hand rules coming out. And the point is, is that a magnetic field will actually make a charged particle move perpendicular to that field. And so what you have here, you're seeing these X's. These are actually showing you imagining it coming out of the page. You have your particle going through. He's actually going to follow a circular trajectory, which turns out is exactly what we want, right? We want these particles to go in a circle. We can actually use these magnetic fields to make them um, do that. So the first way that this was done is in something called a cyclotron. Okay, you can notice by the picture, this is fairly old. This was actually done in 1939. Um, it was actually a guy called Lawrence, and where I work is Lawrence Berkeley Lab. It's named after him. Um, and he actually made the first cyclotron, um, and he got a Nobel Prize for that um, back in 1939. The way it works is it's a spiral, okay? So what you do is you start with your particle in the center here, and you basically make it follow the spiral until it comes out, and then you put it in your detector. The reason that you actually want to have a spiral is this means that you can actually use a constant magnetic field. You can change the radius as the particle moves out, and that way you can keep accelerating it. Because the problem is, if you had just a fixed radius and a constant field, you're not going to just get one value for it. You're not going to be able to accelerate it to actually get into higher um, values. And so you make the spiral to make it go out. There's, of course, another solution. <coughs> the other solution is, let's keep the circle the same size. Uh oh I don't know why we're making noises. Um, and we're going to vary the magnetic field. That way, you get to have one tube. You vary the field as the particles get accelerated to higher and higher values. And then that way, you don't need to have the spiral, because the problem is it's kind of like a linear accelerator again. You only get to use it once, right? Here, you can actually keep going round and round as many times as you want. And again, what you use for actually giving the kick, you know, to give this pulse to accelerate the particles, is using radio frequency pulses, which are timed um, very um, carefully. And this is something, the name for it is called a synchrotron, OK? And this is actually the form that essentially all modern accelerators today um, are actually using. So here now we can look at the LHC. The LHC um, is the largest collider that we have in the world. And it's located just outside Geneva in Switzerland. This is actually a view I see very often, because when I fly there, this is exactly what you see when you land. By the way, that's Mont Blanc. You can actually see that mountain um, sitting there. And here is actually the LHC. Here is the city of Geneva, um, sitting over here. My house um, is just over there. Um, and actually, you can't see the LHC at all, because it's underground. It's actually 100 meters underground. And the reason for this um, is about money. Because it turns out that in France, you actually only, if you buy a house, you actually only own the ground a certain distance under. If you actually go below that, you don't own the ground. Well, it matters, right? Because otherwise you had to buy all this land to actually put the accelerator on. Switzerland, it's not the case. Switzerland, you actually own it all the way to the core of the Earth. <laughs> it's not things that people have thought about. I don't know how it is in South Africa. Does anyone know how deep do you own your ground? There is, there is a limit. There is a limit. Uh huh. OK, so we could also build an accelerator here then, in Cape Town. can be mining underneath. Okay, so all right, great. So we can, we can actually do it. 
All right, so not everybody has been to Geneva, so I actually moved the LHC um, and I brought it to Cape Town. Um, this is actually how big the LHC would be if you actually had it sitting in Cape Town. So we'd start all the way from town, get all the way down to Kenilworth um, underground um, to do it. <coughs> so it's really actually a very big um, device. Sorry? Sorry, I'll just say it would be nice if we had a metro line like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's kind of funny. That, that, that reminds me of something. In the previous accelerator that we had at CERN, which was called the electron-positron collider. It was in the same tunnel, but electron-positrons. This would actually see the train, which goes from Geneva to Paris. You could actually, when it took off, they would actually see a little fluctuation actually in the accelerator itself. And they actually had to correct for that um, to do it. Yeah, so, so you can't actually put a metro next to a collider. That will cause problems, unfortunately. So this is a little bit of a sketch. Um, kind of showing how a collider works. Of course, we need to have two sets of particles, right? Because we're actually trying to collide particles together. In fact, what we're trying to do is to destroy the particles that we actually put in there. And so we usually have two rings, which are the red and the blue um, rings. Actually, this is what they're really called, by the way, inside the actual LHC. If you look at their control room, there's a red ring and a blue ring. Um, <coughs> And what you actually have in here is you have bunches of um, protons. They're actually protons. Um, we can also collide other particles, but usually it's protons. And the reason why you don't just have one is that your actual probability of hitting them is very low. And secondly, your probability of something interesting happening is very low. And so if you just collided together one, you would get very little things happening. So actually, there are many, many protons. I think it's about 10 to the 8, if I remember correctly. Um, protons in each bunch, so lots and lots of protons. Then, of course, inside a proton, now we're going back to this image of having the quarks sitting inside there, it's actually not the proton that collides, because you might remember that there are these little quarks in there and lots of space. So what actually ends up colliding is actually two of the quarks, or the gluons, inside the proton. And these are actually what get destroyed completely, turned into energy. And the idea of it is you take this energy, and once you have pure energy, you have some probability of making all different particles. Unfortunately, of course, most of the time what you actually make is something that's not very interesting, right? You end up making just, you know, something one of the common things, but just every so often you have a chance of making something very interesting. And so when we're, what we're going to talk about next time is actually how we see all these particles and actually how we find the very interesting um, ones um, that come out. Yes? Nope. Um, once you actually make this energy, basically there's a probability of making each particle and it's fixed. You know, we, we know what this is. And so it has an equal probability of making all sorts of different particles um, that we have. It almost never would make the proton again. Um, it would never, very rarely, it can make quarks or makes gluons sometimes, but it never goes back into what it has um, at that point. Now I've got a very, very expensive and very large piece of uh, equipment. Can this not be done with computer simulation? Oh, we use computer simulations all the time. The problem is the computer simulation does what I tell it to do. So if I tell it that a Higgs boson exists, I'm going to find a Higgs boson um, very easily. So we use them actually to study, and we compare our simulations very carefully to the data. But to actually probe the world, we actually need to see, because we didn't know. We didn't know if there was a Higgs boson or not um, when we made it. So from one of the earlier statements that you made, you understand correctly that the mathematics didn't work uh, because of mass and massless. And Higgs figured out that uh, he worked a formula that said there has to be something in there that to make the equations work, and subsequently that has now been proven at CERN. Exactly, and what's very impressive about the story is that this prediction was made 60 years in advance. So he predicted something in the early 60s, saying that there needed to be this particle. It actually took 60 years to be able to build an accelerator that was actually able um, to see.